the signs aren't always a burning bush. Sometimes it's just to take the, you know, my what I learned in that moment was really to take the next right step, even when the next right step is washing the dishes in the morning or brushing your teeth in the morning and just putting one foot in front of the other and doing the next thing that is offered. Welcome to Free Your Inner Guru. I'm your host, Laura Tucker. Our guest on this week's episode is Karen Haycox. Karen is the CEO of Habitat for Humanity in New York City. More than the sum of her parts, Karen is a Canadian living in New York City, a recovering alcoholic, a widow, a daughter, a sister, a friend, a new grandmother, a published author, a dog mom, a former television producer and nonprofit professional. In her day job, Karen is the CEO of Habitat for Humanity NYC. And the answer to the most often asked question is, yes, I have met President and Mrs. Carter. Karen has also traveled to more than 20 countries with Habitat, worked with countless families receiving the homes and thousands of volunteers. Her personal mantra is, take the next right step. The first time that I met Karen, we were at an evening here where I live in Toronto and Karen was one of the speakers and her story, the portion of it that she shared that night was compelling. And at the end of the evening, I marched up to her and asked her if she would come and tell the rest of her story on the Free Your Inner Guru podcast, which she said an absolute resounding yes. So Karen, thank you very much for joining me here today. Thank you for inviting me, Laura. I'm honored to be here. So I'm going to, I want to bring in the listener as though I had never heard your initial story. Um, You're a Canadian who grew up, I take it, in these parts, and now you've, you've ended up in New York City as the head of Habitat for Humanity. Can you bring us into your story as to what some of the the biggest moments were as far as finding your voice and really taking your life into this purpose-built um, journey that you've had? Wow. Um, so <laughs> the journey of a thousand miles, I guess, as they say, right? It uh, begins with the single step. Um, where to start? Um, uh, quick backstory. I was born in uh, Sarnia, Ontario, Canada, went to school in Toronto, um, I think as a, a young person, I, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be um, in my life, I think I would have answered uh, probably movie star. Um, you'll note the difference to that would be I did not answer actress or actor. I answered movie star, which is kind of interesting to me um, that I was much more interested in all things related to fame than I was in actually doing the work of, uh, of the, that uh, acquired that fame. But I was young, so I'll give myself some slack. Um, but the, uh, were my mom and dad here to tell the story, they would probably tell you that I, that was what I always, um, thought that I would do is, is that I would make my living in film and television. And as time went on, um, I indeed, I came to Toronto, I, I studied film and I worked in film and television in Toronto. Um, and I adored it. I think I, I quite honestly defined myself, uh, as, as a producer. It wasn't just what I did for work, but I, really defined myself um, as a producer. I, uh, my whole identity was wrapped up in the work that I did. I produced commercials. I did some corporate, um, large corporate meetings, corporate videos, that sort of thing. Um, and I think when I think about it now, I'm so keenly aware um, of how everything that I valued around my self-worth was wrapped up in what I did um, or in what you thought I did. Um, um, so, but I don't know that I saw that then, you know, life is one of those things. It's a perpetual lesson. Um, sometimes the lessons are in the re- rear view mirror and I can see it abundantly clearly now. Um, and so I made my living in, in Toronto as a, um, as a film producer, I, I, I got to do a lot of fun things. I got to see a lot of fun places and, um, and as life would have it, um, I got downsized in an agency merger. That's a much longer story, but you can imagine um, somebody whose whole identity is wrapped up mm. in what they do for work, what that actually did to my sense of self. I was pretty aimless and, um, and kind of, I, I really felt, uh, um, I re- really remember feeling um, unanchored and, um, and really uncertain of what was next. I thought my life was over. I really, I, as you tend to do when you tend to be younger and something terrible happens, you think, oh my goodness, I'll never, you know, 
how will I ever recover? That's it. Now all of the fun is over. <laughs> um, you know, all wrapped up in that part of the story is also, um, I was, uh, my story now, uh, as, as you know, Laura, from the evening, I spoke a little bit about being a recovering alcoholic. Um, that's part of my story. That part of my story, um, I, I am, I've been sober now for clean and sober for 20 years. So, um, uh, I'm very grateful for the, the twists and turns that my life took, but it's in, it's probably instructive of who I was then to say that I was not in recovery at that time. I was probably, mm-hmm. uh, I was a much more active, actively practicing my craft of being an alcoholic. <laughs> um, and so not, um, like many, um, like many people who suffer and battle addictions, not the bedrock of human stability when it came to assessing, um, or, or having a really practical, honest assessment of, of my own role in my life and the steps and the twists and the turns that it takes. Um, but I'm grateful that, um, probably largely because of that job change, that career change, um, my life followed a series of steps that led me to the doors of recovery. Um, and, um, and, you know, it's, it's so funny. Life is so funny in the rearview mirror because you look, I look back and I think some of the things that I've done since that time, I never would have done, you know, had, had that crisis moment not happened in my early life, um, where I was, you know, severed from the thing that I, that I defined as my life and led kind of, life has a way of sometimes when it drives you to your knees, um, where you really, you really find out who you are um, mm-hmm. if you if you can develop some kind of trust um, in in the universe and its plans. So, um, do you want me to just keep going? Yeah, um, no. Um, well, yes okay. and no. I really I, when you said that about developing trust in the universe and its plans and and allowing yourself to go to the core, that's something that I absolutely identify with. What came out of that for you in terms of um, looking back? Like for me, one of my core lessons of that a similar period in my life was that you know hindsight is always twenty twenty. You do not have a three hundred and sixty degree mirror view to the past, present, and future, and you know can be very hard on myself for missing or not knowing everything. What were some of the gifts in your process? For you, I think the idea of I, I you know, um, I think the idea of recovery really. I mean, I, I, I don't pretend to be a, a spokesperson for any of the recovery programs. You know, we each take our own journey. But I think um, what I found in my journey to sobriety was that, quite honestly, um, when I thought I was at my lowest point, when I thought I was at my bottom when there was no alternative. I think I, I kind of, it's a surrender. You know, we talk a lot about surrender in programs of recovery and, um, and to some degree I surrendered to, it, it seemed like my best plans hadn't worked out the way that I wanted them to. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to say that I was, I'm being too terrible, you know, too hard on myself or anything, but I was in a, in a jackpot and, Um, And I think when you run out of plans and you surrender to the fact that your best thinking hasn't served you very well, there was some part of me that was just willing to listen um, and, uh, and not resistant. It it sort of uh, disarmed me, if you will, um, and readied me to hear the the message. And so that's, that's really the principle that, um, that recovery programs are often, one of the principles that recovery programs are, are often founded on is that, you know, we surrender to win. And, um, and I really, that, that really, I really lived that example. Or I really lived that, that phrase, surrender to win, because um, at what was to be my lowest point is when really, when I look back now is the, the, it began the journey that I, um, that has landed me here today. And, um, and, God willing, and the creek don't rise. Hopefully, there's many tomorrows. And I'm I'm very proud of the journey that I've taken. I've it's been very rich and fulfilling, and um, and and I and I love my life. I'm I I love the life that I lead now, and um, and it all comes from that moment. But it's so difficult because at that moment you can't see that, and um, uh, you can see nothing except the despair and the wreckage that's behind you. So, I I do believe uh, for me there's a, a degree of faith involved. Um, 
and a faith in in a power that's greater than myself and some kind of ability that I, I have a reason to be here and a purpose to be here and 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 uh, I can find my sense of service in that. And that that's really what happened for me. I think that at my lowest moment, I was willing to listen. And sometimes the willingness to listen, you know, I, I have this way of telling my story that I often say, you know, I was always waiting for a burning bush in my life in some way, mm-hmm. shape or form. Like if it, it was, give me a sign, you know, mm-hmm. tell me what to do. Should I take this job? Should I turn left? Should I turn right? Um, should I take this job? Should I move here? Should I date this person or that person? And I was always looking for big signs. And in, and what I think I learned in that moment, again, as I think back on it now, is that the signs aren't always a burning bush. Sometimes it's just to take the, you know, my what I learned in that moment was really to take the next right step, even mm-hmm. when the next right step is washing the dishes in the morning or brushing your teeth in the morning and just putting one foot in front of the other and doing the next thing that is offered. And, um, you know, I think... In my own case, I, you know, I'm a smart, capable woman. I know that. But sometimes, um, specifically in those days, my biggest trouble happens between my ears. I'm trying to figure it all mm-hmm. out um, versus tr- some developing some modicum of trust in just taking the next right step, washing the dishes, getting dressed, doing the thing, you know, taking what's offered to you in the day and, and moving forward, taking the best from it and moving forward. So I learned that in those days and it is, it's served me well. Um, although uh, it, I'd love to tell you, you know, we, we talk about being recovering <laughs> alcoholics and addicts, uh, we people. And, and I think it's, and some, I don't personally, some people use the term recovered. Um, I haven't had a drink or a drug in 20 years, but I often use the word recovering because I believe it's a daily journey. You know, it's a, it's a daily, uh, there is a saying in recovery about it being a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And that's, that has been true for me. I try and, um, and understand that, you know, I have to do the best that I can today with the tools that are, that I'm given today. One of the things that um, you're causing me to think about is that I, not unlike I'm sure pretty much everyone who will be listening to this interview, my family has been touched by alcoholism and addiction in many different ways and people. And, and in my coaching, I've, I've worked with people who are also in recovery and I see more similarities than I do differences as far as my own journey dealing with, um, you know, a tendency towards negative or depressed thinking or just default thinking. I don't think it's, you know, I think most of us have, um, a, an inner challenge of not being up in our head all the time and trying to figure it all out. I catch myself doing that frequently and it becomes a part of that discipline of every day. You know, what do, um, what do I need to do today to create that future that I do see? And I just finished reading on vacation, um, Russell Brand's book recovery. And I feel like every human being needs to read that book. I don't know if you've read it at all, but the way that he, he talks about his process and how that informs him every day is really quite, uh, it's very compelling. Um, I have not read the book. I, had, I heard an interview with him and I, I find him to be a very compelling uh, person, be, I think because of his recovery, his, I think his recovery journey to me is what makes him attractive to me um, to listen to because I, I know that there's some... Um, I just, I really loved the interview, but I, and it's mm-hmm. interesting cause it's on my list of books, but I have, it isn't one that I picked up, but it, I definitely would like to, to, uh, to read it. Yeah. He's very transparent about what his daily process is. Of, and so there's, mm-hmm. so that will be very interesting. Um, I think to anyone to read, but when I talk to some of the people, sometimes I feel like I want to make them feel supported because it's like, yeah, I feel that too. Now the consequences aren't as drastic of me, you know, indulging because they're not as severely harmful to my body, my relationships, my mind. But I think it's a journey of consciousness and spirituality and faith as much as a journey of self-care. 
Absolutely. It's um, alcohol is a symptom. It's not the problem. Um, and so I happen to subscribe just in general to the to the notion that we are all more alike than we are different. And the, the countries and the people that I've had the good fortune um, to, to spend my life meeting, I, I am so keenly aware of that, is that we are so we are just so much more alike than we are different if we choose to focus on the similarities versus the differences. And I think that's really what where recovery started for me. I think um, I, the way that I sometimes characterize it is how I, how I presented, I said there, there was a, a Karen, but then how I presented myself to the world. Um, and then there was the Karen that I believed myself to be, um, mm-hmm. which was something less than that. So if, You'll forgive me for not for saying the word yardstick. Um, I guess or meter stick, but no, I'm we can do yardstick, yardstick. Don't you but, worry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a yardstick somewhere. Like there was a yardstick somewhere out there, and um, you saw me somewhere on it, and I was hopeful that you saw me somewhere close to the top. And but on the inside, the Karen that I saw was the was somewhere very close to the bottom. And I used to say that I drank to fill the gap, and I think that. That is not a unique feeling, a feeling that is unique to alcoholics or drug addicts. I think that that is just that we use the substance or abuse the substance in that way to fill the gap rather than more healthy coping mechanisms or, um, or personal growth mechanisms. We just try and, uh, try and shrink that gap, right? How you see me, um, and how I know myself to be. Or if I show myself, show myself to you who I really am, you won't like me was the big fear I lived with. Um, and and so recovery has taught me one day at a time in these, the last 20 years that is to be who I am matters, you know, who I am is valid and to be that person, not to have different faces, um, to, not to present uh, a different face to the world than I really believe that I am. And I think that's a product of recovery. I think it's a product of becoming of, of aging um, and maturity and experience as, um, as we live longer, we learn experiences and hopefully we, you know, we incorporate them into our living. But I, you know, oddly enough, I was just saying, um, I mentor a few younger women and I was just saying the other day, you know, I'm very proud today that, you know, I, I, I really am who I present myself to be. Mm. Um, there's kind of one, one Karen really like her or lumper, you know, that, that I'm more or less what you see is what you get. And there's such great peace in that, mm. that, that I don't have, you know, that I don't have to um, pretend to be anything that I'm not. Um, and so, and there's also great joy and, and just serenity in that whole aspect of, you know, I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the room, but no, neither am I on the other end of the spectrum. I'm not the, you know, the, so it's, there's just some real, um, uh, I just really embrace that being um, being who I present myself as. It's there's just it's a comfortable place. It sounds like the integrated Karen who's taken from every <laughs> step of the way. Yeah, it, yeah. Can you take us on part of your journey from when you when you had that you know I guess first defining moment of losing your um, job in the production world and where you were at personally to, to where you are now in this role of leadership in a different country with a, uh, in, with an organization that I would not immediately associate with the film industry. So there's a, a distance traveled there. Yeah. Yeah, there is, it, you know, that there's that journey of a thousand miles and the single step thing. And it's, you know, it was, it's, it's interesting to me, certainly. Um, I know, so I lost, um, so I lost that position. You know, there was a, a whole messy bunch of time in there where I was resisting the idea that I was, that I needed um, a, a recovery program. I mean, I don't think anybody, well, it has been my experience, let me say it that way, that people in recovery don't generally jump in, um, joyfully with both feet, um, and embrace the notion that, uh, that we are alcoholics. I, t- I tended to see it at the time, like some kind of a, a death sentence, you know, my life, all the fun in my life is over and quite the opposite has, uh, it has been quite the opposite is true. I will tell you that for sure. My life really began in earnest, I think when, uh, when recovery found me and I found recovery, but, um, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't give credit to the people and uh, the largely women, um, but but women and men who were existing in the recovery programs when I entered them because they shared their experience, their strength, and their hope with me. 
um, and gave me a sense that that life without alcohol uh, and drugs was actually possible. And so that was the early recovery for me. It was really just beginning about the business of finding out who I was um, when I wasn't um, when I wasn't looking when I was when I wasn't so wrapped up in 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 kind of the outer world um, and what I did for work. Um, and what I, you know, what kind of wine I was drinking with dinner or what I was drinking before dinner and all of that stuff, finding out who Karen really was underneath of all of that, underneath all that stuff. And so I did some, what I'll call just J-O-B jobs, just some regular jobs during that period of time to keep, to keep income coming in. I was still, um, and, and I just learned, I guess I just kept learning to put one foot in front of the other and do what I needed to do. I still was pretty depressed and thinking my life was over and I'll never amount to anything. I can remember a lot of despairing thinking at that time, but um, as as each step went turned and each day of sobriety and clear thinking turned into the next and um, I was given newer opportunities and I was offered an opportunity in um, Windsor at the time I was, I had, by this point, I had gone back to Sarnia, um, uh, and my mom and dad were, and, and I was living, you know, in all of my grandiosity, uh, in my parents' spare room at 30 something years old. Um, and yet I was, so I was just trying to do the next right thing, right? Stay sober another day, go to a meeting for me. That's what, that was my journey, but also to get a job and, and try and rebuild my life. And so after doing a couple of these jobs, um, I was offered this opportunity in Windsor that was quite outside of my area of expertise. And um, I think if I've learned anything is that the, the transferable skills are, everybody's got them. And mm-hmm. I think it's it's a matter of sort of presenting those, identifying what they are and being able to articulate them to a new audience. Um, and there was a company in Windsor that took a chance on me as an executive recruiter and I don't know if I'm honest with you, I did not want the job. I did not want to move to Windsor in all of my newly sober grandiosity because the ego dies last. I, tell you. <laughs> um, I thought that that was a terrible step down for me. Um, however, I was, you know, I was, I, my, uh, we have sponsors in the program of recovery that I subscribe to. And she said, you know, you, you need to do, you need to be, fully self-supporting through your own contributions, you might need to look at this. So I ended up in this recruiting job and the the fellow that hired me said, he explained to me why he felt I was the perfect candidate for the job. And what he articulated to me was the transferable skills, which was Mm. that as a producer, what I did was I looked at a job, I broke it down into the, the people the, um, and the, and the facilities that I needed to accomplish the job. So if it was a 30 second commercial, who were the actors I was going to hire? What was the, who was the cameraman I was going to hire? Who was the director? Who, where did the music score come from? Where did we shoot it? All of those things. And he said, all you're doing in an executive recruitment is you are breaking down a job or a position need and hiring the right people to fill that need. And when he put it to me in that way, I, I kind of, I remember thinking, well, yeah, I can do that. So I moved to Windsor, not as, despite my better judgment, which just harkened back to had never served me particularly well in the past <laughs> anyway, but nonetheless, it was what I was subscribing to. And, um, and I will tell you that it was, it was the, it, I often refer to it as, as really the only job I ever had meaning. I went in the morning at eight o'clock and I left at about six. And in those days we carried a pager just in case anything happened overnight. But, and I did that for two and a half years and I, and I developed just one day at a time and I built a life. Um, and, and that life, instead of being all wrapped around my, my grandiose profession, it, it sort of right-sized itself, work right-sized itself in what I defined as success. Um, I had a social life and friends and, um, I bought a small home, no short of, nothing short of a miracle there. Um, and, um, and I created some balance. And so I love to tell this story because, um, how I came to Habitat was at, not at all for any altruistic reasons. I would love to tell you that I, mm. I was always driven to serve other people. Um, that necessarily is not necessarily true. Um, what I was trying to do, uh, at the time was, the local chapter of Habitat for Humanity in Windsor was looking to hire an executive director. And I, the fellow who was the chair of the board of directors was um, a significant employer in the market. And I really wanted to get, um, 
his work. He had a couple of open executive positions and I really wanted to be able to recruit for those. Mm. And so I saw Habitat for Humanity as a means to that end. So um, long story, very short, I submitted a candidate as a cold letter of intro and said, I interviewed this woman and I thought she would be terrific for your job. I'd love to meet with you. He called me, we met, they ended up doing a full recruit. They hired that woman, which is interesting to me. And the, and, um, and, uh, and he said, I'm, I'm going to, and I, of course, quite magnanimously said, we're not going to charge you the, the finder's fee because, of course, we wanna, we're happy to support Habitat for Humanity. And he said, no, no. He said, I'm sure that you probably, some of your uh, compensation is wrapped up in, in, uh, in, in this. So I'm going to pay the compensation fee to your employer. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, but there's one condition. You have to come and be on the board of directors for the Habitat affiliate. Wow. So, <laughs> so how I started, so how I got involved, my first start with Habitat was I said, sure. And um, I started on the board and they hired that executive director. And from the moment I went on to a build site, I loved it because mm-hmm. for me, that's where the transferable skills came into play. They were sure it was a house being built and the, and the people who I was mobilizing were volunteers and trade skilled trades folks and people and uh, from around the community, but there was media and there was, you know, there was all of the facilities that all of the same elements that I had been involved in, in TV production. And so from that perspective, it felt so familiar to me. And yet it had this component that was so connected to my heart. I, you know, I, I was so filled up by, and so moved by the families that I met that were moving into these homes. And suddenly this, job, this work that was going underway, I, that felt so much like my TV life, mm. had real meaning, real depth. It was the same kind of passion, the same kind of thing. I wanted to do it all the time. Um, you know, I was, I, 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 I don't know that I envisioned immediately that there would be a job for me in it, but I was passionate about it. I was a, I was committed, a committed board member. I was, I mean, I wanted, to, I was so filled up by it that mm-hmm. I wanted to be more involved. I call it, I still to this day use the term small as selfish. You know, I think of the work at Habitat for Humanity that I get paid for as small as selfish, meaning it, it, it fills me up, um, in a way I do it because I feel good about it. And it makes me feel like, um, we all can work really hard every day doing whatever it is that we do. And yet I am blessed and very fortunate that when I put my head on the pillow, at the uh, at the end of the day, to this day, I still realize that I've moved the needle for a family or families in need, and there's very that's very fulfilling to me. I um, that I have found that to be very fulfilling. So that's how I got started, and that was in Windsor, and and then they uh, they sometime later um, that executive director left, and they asked me to throw my name in the hat, and so that's how I got started was in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, as the executive director of Habitat. So. It really is the next right step. It's saying yes. It really, <laughs> right? Like it, it is. It's just, it, it is. It is. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's, it's surprising. You know, it's, um, you know, that was, it, I mean, it, and it continues. It's unfortunate that we don't have some kind of, you know, detector that tells us what, you know, that this is the next right step. Mm. Uh, at least that was not the case for me. And that's where the trust came in. I think the idea of faith and recovery that mm-hmm. really pulled me in to say, you know, I just need to take, sometimes you don't get the burning bush. You just take the step that is in front of you to take. And that that's one of the things around the whole idea of this freeing your inner guru. The, the very name of this podcast is is giving yourself permission to just allow yourself to turn and in, tune into that. And, yeah. you know, and it goes back to the getting out of your head and, and, and ha- one part faith, one part gut instinct and willingness to say yes. Yep. It's risk. There's risk, right? You know, if you mm-hmm. can't, when you don't know how the story is going to end, sometimes you need, sometimes desperation will put you on a path. And, and if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, 
um, you end up in places you could never have imagined. That has been true. It is true that you could describe my story in that way, mm-hmm. that it was in some part driven by desperation. In some part, you, um, it was driven by a faith in, in the fact that if I do the next, take the next right step, then the next, then the outcome will be appropriate. Mm-hmm. Um, another piece of advice that someone gave me once, you know, and because I, I still, we all, I think, struggle to this day with the notion that, um, you know, what, how do I know, you know, should I do this or should I do that? Sometimes I can still be almost paralyzed. Sometimes I think, um, when I think back, you know, if I had not moved to this location, I would not have Mm -hmm. met these people. And then I would not have done this. And then I would not have, I can be stented by the gravity of, of a decision sometimes where I think, well, but it'll, everything, the outcome will be different if I turn left versus turn right. And, um, and somebody, um, somebody gave me a piece of another piece of wisdom that I sometimes hearken around that. And it's like, if it, if it isn't offered, it isn't, it wasn't intended. Mm. And so sometimes I, I think a lot about what would have happened if I turned right instead of left. And, and I go back to that. And in some way that gives me solace, you know, is that, that if I've missed out on what I perceive to be an opportunity, if it wasn't offered, it wasn't intended. So if I had, you know, if I turned left and got this offer, that's what was intended. I'm not, I'm not a fatalist in that bold a way where mm-hmm. I just believe it's all pre, pre, predestined or pre late, you know, all laid out. But I, I do believe that, um, that, that there's a framework, you know, of just taking the next right step and, and, uh, trusting, trusting in the outcome, mm-hmm. um, that, that has served me, served me well. Well, and you can't see the possibilities that come out of being in that, the position of that next step until you've taken it. You really can't. You really can't. You sometimes, to some degree, you can't see where you've gone right or wrong, except when it's in the rearview mirror. That has been my experience. So there is an element of trust here. If you don't like the word faith, you know, use the word trust, you know, just just trust that all we do. If you do the right things, the right things will follow. I mean, they don't always, sometimes you got to trip up a couple of times and, and, uh, and fall down a couple of times. But if you do, I, I just really believe that that is true, that if you do the right things, the right, th- the right things will follow. Along your journey, you've had, um, you've had a number of other relationships and, um, and have, you're in a position, I'm sure, at Habitat where you have a voice every day and you have voice on issues that are very contemporary to us. Can you share a little bit about your writing in the book Pantsuit Nation and how that all came about? Yes. Um, thank you for asking that. I'm always happy to tell this part of my story, although it's a, it is a, certainly a painful one. Um, Habitat also put me on the road and moving to Windsor put me on a road that led me to meet the woman who would become my wife. Um, her name was Trudy and we were together for 15 years. Um, and I, I remember I moved Habitat also, Habitat Windsor also mm-hmm. led me to an opportunity to move to the United States, um, uh, conveniently locating myself in Michigan. Trudy lived in Michigan. So I followed not only the love of my life, but also my career path, um, into the United States. And, um, and so, uh, worked for Habitat internationally. So I now, uh, I, I parlayed Habitat for Humanity, Windsor, Essex, and the local expression of the global entity into a position with the global organization of Habitat International. And coincidentally got to um, live in the same country as my, um, my wife. And um, <laughs> so Trudy and I were together for uh, 15 years. We were actually, uh, we were, Trudy would describe us as married, but not churched. Um, we in fact did get married when it became legal in the United States uh, in 2000. We were married in 2013 and sadly um, we were only to be married for seven months. Um, Trudy died of cancer in uh, 2014. And, um, and it was, it, when I think about it now, it was, you know, there's just no easier way to say it than it sucked, you know. And I wish I could think of a more eloquent way of describing the journey, but it, it just, anyone who has lost a significant other and, and walked the journey of uh, battling cancer um, certainly knows what I'm talking about. And anyone who uh, is the survivor of of a primary relationship like that knows all of the complexities of the world that 
of the grief that you go through um, and continue to go through. Um, And, you know, certainly notwithstanding the fact that Trudy and I were uh, married lesbians in a country and in a world where we lived in a state, the the American system versus the Canadian system is so much more complex to describe. Um, but But in our case, we lived in the state of Michigan, um, which did not recognize same-sex marriage in a country which had just newly federally begun to recognize same-sex marriage, um, thanks to President Obama. And, um, and so um, it was a very complex time, if you'll forgive the, uh, the way I'm going to characterize this, it was a very complex time to be a married lesbian. And Mm -hmm. or to be a lesbian widow, because uh, it was quite literally very complicated to sort out the details that are very complicated and terrible and tragic and painful to wade through in the immediate aftermath of losing uh, a spouse. Um, Layer on top of that, the fact that there was this legality issue. So... Mm. Um, by the grace of God and by the good thinking of my late wife, um, we had a lot of things. We had sorted out a lot of things beforehand. We had a, um, we had a will and a, and, um, a living will and a power of attorney in place and a partnership agreement. Um, uh, she, she used to say in case that I, in case I ever left her for, uh, an, another woman, for a younger woman, she would always say, we need to have a partnership agreement. So we know, you know, what the, what the terms of our separation are that served it, all of the, that served me well in the immediate aftermath of Trudy's death. Um, I hope I don't sound glib because it, because it was a terrible pain, painful time, but no. you know, you, yeah, it's, Not a, at all. it's, we all, it's a complex, complex road. Um, so I navigated through that and, um, and, uh, and with the, with the help once again of being in the right place, I had a community of neighbors and friends that were Herculean in their efforts of being around me and around mm-hmm. us at a time when I needed, I, and we needed them the most. Um, and so, uh, and so that was in 2014 Um, Fast forward to current modern day and the current administration in the United States is, and the current environment, if you will, in the United States is, continues to be changing and challenging to people who are on the margins and um, people within the LGBTQ community uh, in the United States are very much on the margins. And so in the immediate aftermath of the um, the elections in 2016 and um, the current occupant of the White House. I don't think at the time, we, I don't think anybody really knew uh, the extent to which some decisions would be made or the coming decisions would be made or the people that would be put into power and the impact of those decisions. Um, but at that time, there was a, a private Facebook site that came up and it was called Pantsuit Nation. It actually started before the close of the election because it's called Pantsuit Nation as a bit of an homage to, um, to Hillary Clinton. And, um, and it really, what it, what it was, was a private Facebook posting site where people could share positive stories or, or stories of, uh, or challenging stories, stories where you were person, very personal stories in a place that was safe and where you didn't, you weren't trolled or you didn't have to, you know, be fearful of any repercussions. So there's a little, there, it was a, it, I think it currently sits at about 4 million, um, this pantsuit nation or this, it's called pantsuit nation and it's on Facebook and it's about 4 million members and it's still very active today. Um, so, uh, it was shortly after the election. I had joined Pantsuit Nation. I was, you know, we were all reading voraciously the stories of, of people and their reactions to the election. And I posted, um, I told the story of my journey with Trudy and my journey as a, as a lesbian widow and my fears and concerns around what this new election might mean for people such as myself. And um, I typed it quite honestly sitting on my couch very shortly after what would have been my third wedding anniversary, Mm -hmm. typed it with my thumbs, you know, posted it on the site, um, and then put aside my phone and went about my day, came back and, and there were something to the tune of about 5,000 likes on, you know, how Facebook shows you a little bubble Mm -hmm. on your phone and tells you how many you've got a new message. There was something like 5,000 and it was people who had liked the post, reacted to the post, 
Um, and it, it was just, it was incredible. I mean, that was in the space of the first hours. And then, um, I, the, and so I told the story, this story very in my own voice. I didn't edit it. You know, it's, I'm sure there were typos and that sort of thing, but, um, but the reaction was stunning. Um, I think it currently sits at about 50,000 comments. It's still on the site, but, and I was, um, it just, I guess it, it's a complex set of feelings that come with that post because I feel such a sense of honor that I got to tell Trudy's story in that way and that it, it, um, it caused such a groundswell of reaction, our story. And, um, and then what also happened is that people, other members that I don't know who were um, lesbian widows or not or other widows or people who felt uh, a sense of identification or relation to my story have reached out to me personally um, some of them I am still in contact with and people who have said, you're, you told my story, you know, and, um, uh, such a powerful experience for me, storytelling in that way. And, um, such a sense of, we talked earlier about identifying and not comparing, you know, a sense of yes. identifying and finding commonality with someone else. It made me feel a, like I had, honored my relationship with Trudy, that I had told our story and that it had impacted somebody, filled me up. It made me feel much less alone in that mm -hmm. people as unique as I thought my story was, because of course we all feel that our story, that no one is going through their story just like we are. And um, it, it made me feel very much like, um, like I had company. Um, my mother has a saying, misery loves company. And, and I don't think she made it, meant it in a positive way, but in a, in, in a sense, it was certainly a positive thing in that there is, there is peace in someone saying, I know what you're saying. That's my story. I know exactly what you mean. That's back. That goes back to recovery. So I had it again here and that people were reaching out to me and saying, you really helped me. You really helped me by telling that story. And the fact that I am still in contact with some of these women who I've never met face to face um, through that mechanism is really, really powerful. And they included the, um, they approached me sometime later and they uh, created a book, uh, Pantsuit Nation did, and they selected, I think it's uh, 200 stories mm. from um, the stories that were submitted. And I'm very honored to say that they included our story in the book. And so um, just very, very, very honored that that uh, that our story is is included in that book, and, and it's a wonderful piece of writing. I will leave a, a link to um, Pantsuit Nation in the in the show notes on this interview, so people can can find it. Um, I think one of the things that happens in a situation like that, when the vulnerability of opening up about a difficult story. It helps to bring it's either people in from the margins or expand the margins. So when we don't feel like we are so unique in our challenges, it it helps to to it helps with the healing. At least that's been my own experience. But it also um, expands a sense of humanity. Like you know, it's different. Uh, I it's it's not hashtag me too, but it's me too. You know, like I yeah. feel this too. And yeah, it is. That is so true. It is so true. You know, there's a saying in recovery um, that it's it, it, there's terminal uniqueness, and mm. um, and and I just it is so true that we can consider ourselves so unique that we that we it can be lethal. You know, that if we don't find someone that we can unique ourselves right to, of course, we're all unique and we have a unique set of gifts and stuff. Some people have struggled with the fact that in some way they're not unique. I mean, of course, we're all unique. We get that. But the, we're, I think that the places, the pain points, we are not unique. The tragedies, there's almost nothing that we can go through that somebody can't relate to. And finding someone to relate to that, there is such peace in that. When someone mm -hmm. nods their head and says, I've been there. I know exactly what you mean, or you're telling my story or, you know, it's, it's a, it's an incredibly powerful experience. Well, I've just had a couple of conversations re recently that, that points to when, when we, when each of us starts to think that we are so unique or different, it also, you know, it turns the mind inwards on itself and 
changes the worldview. And, and sometimes there's not a whole lot of difference um, between that type of thinking and narcissistic type of thinking. Because you can't get outside right. of your bubble. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, um, I'm, you can tell probably by now your listeners can tell already. I know I'm, I'm a fan of, of sayings. I really have turned into my mother, I think, because <laughs> she always had a host of them. But, you know, it's, but there's another one that I, uh, that I say that with absolute reverent respect now, um, too, that I, you know, that would be a good thing for me to turn into my mother. But, um, but she, you know, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, you know, it's, it's, um, and it's, it's such a, it's so true. Um, it's so true. One of the, one of the, this is truth telling, you know, and I meet mm-hmm. new people now. Um, I try and, cause we're, we can all do it. You know, you sort of slip into, I'm not really listening to you. I'm, I'm just waiting to talk. Right. And, yes. um, and so, and so what I try, I really do when I meet new people. And of course now I'm in New York city and I meet a lot of new people all the time. And I try and, and I, this sounds terrible that I'm, that I have to make my, but I try and force myself to ask questions. Even if I'm in a position where I'm not, um, I'm, I'm either delivering the message or I'm just being, you know, or maybe I'm just being cordial or polite or something. I'll try and, I'll try and ask some questions of people like, Oh, well, did you grow up in New York or something that's personal? Did you, mm-hmm. you know, how did you come to be here or what, you know, oh, or where do you walk your dog? Something that is completely, you know, personal because I can be so wrapped up in my version of the story that I, I forget that other people all people are going through struggles and, and when you open the door to conversation in that way is that's really where the identification can come in, where someone mm-hmm. can say, you know, it's just, it's amazing. It's just, even we can incorporate it into work. We were talking the other day about, I said, listen, I'm keenly aware in New York city, you can go into a group, uh, a curated group of professionals and leave and you said you had a good time and it was great and the content was good, but you didn't meet anybody. And, or if you did, it was all, everybody stays in their own lane. You know, you don't really interact. So we're actually trying to incorporate in our work life, some in our work events, some mechanism by which to, to foster or facilitate personal engagement. Um, and someone was telling me the story of how they had someone, they had been to a meeting and the, the facilitator said, um, tell a person you have to stand up and tell one personal story about yourself that is completely irrelevant to what we're discussing here. And some young woman stood up and said, I've had my identity stolen. And about five people in the room went, Oh my God, I've had my identity stolen. And so by the end of that day, they all came, you know, people had, they had made connections because they had this crazy story in common. And I thought, my goodness, there's gotta be a way to anchor that in what we do every day where we, foster those kinds of an openness or foster those kinds of real conversations based on shared experiences, regardless of whether you're doing it for Habitat for Humanity or, or just in your everyday life. It's, I, I agree with you and it's, and I, I guilty of the, as charged as far as, um, you know, I think with the society that we live in, especially with the technology and the social media that we, it's almost like we can get stuck on broadcast mode and where you're just putting stuff out there and, and the interaction is lost. So you can go and you can sit down with somebody and we used to uh, talk to our teenage son about, you know, a conversation has two sides, right? Questions and answers from both people and then listening to those answers. Exactly. Exactly. Really otherwise, listening, right? otherwise not, you just start to not, feel isolated again. Exactly. Exactly. It is social media is, I don't, I don't know that we know the extent to which social media is having an impact on it's on, on us as a population. I mean, I think we, we there's a lot of conversation about the impact, you know, uh, the impact of it on the election. There's, there's a lot of conversation about, um, you know, it gives us license to say things we would never say in front of it to someone's face. I mean, if you read the, I mean, the most disheartening thing I think any of us can do is read the chain of comments on any kind of public story. It's just, I mean, it makes me, it turns my stomach and, and yes, largely it's because it's from people and a side that I don't necessarily agree with, but it's just the very 
the lack of humanity in it is um, is stunning. It's just stunning. Mm-hmm. The, un, the 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 darkness that the dark side of humanity that it seems to uh, it seems to I was going to say give life to, but that's a terrible thing to say. But that it seems to fan the flames of some kind of real dark side of that of of humanity that just is ugh, just nauseating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, being able to hide behind the technology and uh, yeah. And then we see, yeah. you know, expressions of it that are dramatic and fierce when, you know, when they don't. Um, exactly. When you, you're in a role of leadership now, and leadership is one of the, the hot button topics of probably now this generation. I think we're at the early stages. And you've evolved into a role of leadership, and leadership is my number one thing to favorite thing to talk about these days. What do you, what do you consider to be the most important qualities of an authentic leader? And how does that relate to how you conduct yourself at Habitat and just in the world at large? It's interesting uh, because you use the word authentic leader. And I think authenticity is, is for me is the driving trait. Um, I really strive to be, who I authentically am, um, regardless of whether I am being Karen CEO of Habitat for Humanity or Karen dog mom in the, in the dog park. Um, I, I want to be, I want to be authentic. I don't want to put on a mask that has me be someone different. And so when I'm with my team, I supervise a team of roughly 60 folks here in New York city. And, um, and some of them, as you might imagine, are younger, um, younger leaders, younger, maybe first career folks or second, early in their second career. And I think the biggest gift that I can give to them is listening. Um, first, I didn't come in with a predetermined plan for, I've been with Habitat for a long time, but three years ago when I got to New York, I didn't say, okay, I have a plan. This is what we're going to do. You know, I, I, and I quite deliberately went around to talk to everybody and I said, I'm going to, I'm going to assume a listening posture here. We're going to, we're going to, I'm going to listen for a while. I know that you're looking for big, bold pronouncements and big, bold strategies. And I'm, I'm just going to spend some time listening. New York is a unique um, city and this is a unique, we face some unique challenges as an organization here. And so I think really the gift of listening, trying to really listen to the ideas from, uh, from the team themselves, I think as a leader is important. I think um, certainly you have to establish yourself as a leader, but I don't know that you have to do that with loud pronouncements. I think you can do that from a position of listening and and trying to. I really see my strategy or my my divining principles as a leader as giving life to the good ideas and setting aside the ideas that come from my team that that maybe don't. That, that we need to set aside at the moment. And I say that time and time again here. I think that the best ideas come from my team who are closer to the action. Um, mm. And so I always go to them. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm unafraid to say, you know, this isn't my sweet spot. You need to tell me more and to dig into, you know, some of the more complex areas of building multifamily housing in New York City, um, which you can, I can guarantee you is a very complex space, mm. space to work within. Um, so there's a lot to know. So I don't have to know it all, but I have to be able to hire, have the right people, hire and retain the right people around me who can give me good advice and who I can say thank you and then make a decision. I think there are times also where I have to say thank you, but this is not a democracy. Um, mm. So it's a I, I think, and then I think probably if I had another strategy, it's that some of the things that I have that make me what I hope is a good CEO are the things that I struggled with by having people as supervisors who were not so good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I think that when I look back at some of those uh, examples in my life, I look back and think, well, I know who I'm not going to be in this. I know I know what killed my inspiration as a younger professional. I'm not Mm. going to do that. And so some I have learned to emulate by example, and some I have learned to, to design quite, quite the opposite by, by hard one negative example. So, um, it's a, that's, I think those are, that's really where I am as a CEO. It's a, it's, 
um, it's a daily challenge, like, much like life and like recovery, it's a daily challenge because it's, um, you know, to do the best, to take the next best step mm-hmm. um, based on the, the set of uh, options and parameters that are offered each day. That's profound. I like that. Like it, it's well, simple. It's simple and clear to listen to, but then you think that the application of it is, it is a, a daily practice or a daily discipline. It really is. I think we, we tend to try and want to complicate things. I really do think that we try and tend to complicate things. Um, and, and sometimes the simplest answer, the most straightforward answer, the one that's closest to you, my friends in the, in the South would say, you know, the alligator that's closest to you. Sometimes <laughs> the alligator that's closest to you is the one you got to worry about, you know, or the one that you got to focus on. <laughs> Going forward, if someone's listening to the podcast and they're grappling with the, the, with the idea of what an effective leader is today and in the future, um, what advice would you give them? I think the, the biggest advice for me is listening. Um, listening to, if you've got a team doing whatever, whether there's two or 20 of them and they're in the field uh, and doing the work, I, I think that's my go-to place um, is that I think you've got to really listen to your team. What are the innovations that are coming that, that you're either poised to respond to or not? Um, I don't think that you have to be, you don't have to be the answer person. I think you, I think in fact, if anything, I think the CEO should be the question person asking for clarity, certainly, you know, armed and aware of what's going on in the world and in the sector, but asking questions questions of your team, questions, you know, regardless of their level, you know, what is your biggest challenge? What do you see as where we're going to go? I think colleague colleague organizations, I often say as a CEO, you know, there's oftentimes you want to look to your left or your right and and you need a buddy, you know, to just look at and say, Mm -hmm. can you believe this? You know, and I think fostering um, colleague relationships, truth tellers in your world who you can look at and say, Am I like, I can't see the forest for the trees here, you know, help me. Or, or sometimes it's just a matter of calling somebody and saying, can you believe this? Listen, you'll never believe this story. Mm. And, um, I've been very, uh, blessed to have to build that. I call that, um, I call that my, our water cooler club. I don't think I can take credit for that name. I think it's one of my colleagues <laughs> from long ago at Habitat International. We worked, we all worked remotely. A lot of us did. And so we formed this water cooler club where sometimes you just need to call somebody and have a colleague, right? And have a conversation around the water cooler. So we did it remotely and I've kind of resurrected it into my current day. And I do it a lot here in New York city. I have a couple of close, interestingly, a lot of female leaders uh, in affordable housing in New York city. And so we have what I call, again, our water cooler club that we go out for lunch or sometimes we just do a quick conference call and, and you know, designed to give us a relief valve, you know, or to, to check in and say, tell me, tell me what you hear here or what mm. would you do? And um, there's real strength in that. I've seen you have a voice on many issues um, via Facebook. And, uh, and I love that you advocate for the issues of the day, which are largely centering around being a woman and being a woman in leadership and then taking that into an organization like Habitat and having a tangible transformational impact on the world. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, I'm really, I mean, I'm so privileged to have had the opportunities that I have had. I'm so keenly aware of that privilege. I had, feel a great sense of responsibility to do, um, to do, to, to, to provide a voice where I have an opportunity to do so. And, um, I, I have a lot of opportunities here to meet people who are of some note in the, specifically in the women's issues world. And, and I was referring to myself kind of laughingly as a lapsed feminist the other day and Mm. and um and and it was someone who actually works with Gloria Steinem who for me is a personal mentor and um and she and this is the person who works with her she said to me you're you're not a lapsed feminist you're just maybe you're a little maybe you're a little you were a little out of touch with your activism or your your Mm. role in and uh but for some time she said I would debate that with you because she too is friends with me on Facebook so she knows (laughs) that I'm pretty vocal about things but she um 
but but it's true, you know, so it's true. And I just feel a sense that I feel a keen sense of responsibility to the privilege that I have enjoyed. I'm, you know, in my little place in the world, I have been afforded a lot of opportunity. And, and so I feel a sense of responsibility to, to use that wisely and to open and to be open, um, to, to share that message with others, to share the, that with the women that work for, and men that work for me and the people that I engage with every day. So. Well, I can think of no better example of exactly walking your talk around taking the next right step. And I want to thank you so much for coming on here today to share your journey with us and to show us that, you know, the accumulation of all those right steps can take you to places that you could never imagine at times in your life, but then open up a world of new possibilities to be able to contribute and have impact in a a broader way. So Karen, thank you so much for coming on here today. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be your guest. Thank you. And, uh, and I'll be, I'm honored to be an avid listener as well. So I, um, thanks for the opportunity. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Free Your Inner Guru. I hope you enjoyed listening to this conversation as much as I did recording it. Karen's story is extraordinary, and yet there are so many themes within it that I think we can all relate to. I would love it if you would take a few moments to share this episode via email, on social, and come on over to iTunes, Stitcher, or the website to leave a comment and review positive reviews help to attract new listeners to the audience. And that's something that I would be very grateful to have your support with. Have yourself a wonderful week. And until next time, this is Laura Tucker signing off for Free Your Inner Guru.